Tier 1, Chapter 5. Are you asking yourself whether you believe in this system and world? Have you bought in? In Chapter 5, we're going to see again just how normal things can be in such an abnormal reality. And you're going to start getting a hint of some things that might not be exactly as they seem. Chapter 5 Eric and I sit on a wooden bench in the courtyard after meeting with Tal's instructor, Mr. Dane. The ancient willow tree next to us gently waves in the breeze, its low hanging branches sweeping the native grasses in nearly silent communion. An ant wanders over my toes, and as uncomfortable as the sensation is, I don't disturb it. I like watching it meander. As a parent, I often find myself bristling slightly when I receive suggestions from the boys' mentors or instructors. I know this feeling comes from my own insecurities, my own worry that I'm not good enough. More than that, though, it stems from a deep, gut-wrenching place where I wonder if they might know something about my child that I don't. It is completely unrealistic to think that I would be able to have a monopoly on knowing a person, but I still secretly want it. Mr. Dane, as expected, wasn't worried about Tal's questioning in class, but he did feel like it was an indication of his need to be working with a more advanced peer group. I hadn't realized that he was hitting a developmental stage earlier than many boys his age, nor did I understand that this would mean making adjustments to his conditioning. Being a first-time parent is hard. I'm way out of my depth. What are you thinking about? Eric asks. Just Tal. How big he's getting. How much I want to keep him safely in the little box I've created in my mind for him. I exhale slowly. How incompetent I am at doing this parenting thing right? Eric laughs, settling his arm across my shoulders. You and me both. Even though we've watched other parents raise kids to adulthood, I wasn't really paying attention, I murmur. What do you mean? I wasn't listening when they talked about the struggles they were having or the feelings they had during transitions like this. I have only ever tuned into things that were relevant for me at the time. I missed out. I think that's pretty normal, Eric muses. I also don't recall having that many opportunities to talk with people who have been through this before. Don't get me wrong, I love Matt, but I have often wondered if it would have been more beneficial to match with a mentor who had the opportunity to have children. I nod. That's a good point. Do you think they will ever adjust that? Sherry gets me, but there have been times when I haven't been able to fully open up because I know my parenting struggles wouldn't resonate with her. I shift closer to him, resting my head against his shoulder. I think it's definitely something that should be considered. It's difficult, though, because when we match up with mentors, we don't necessarily know who's going to pair and who isn't. The question would really be, could we match with a mentor later? When we know what an individual's trajectory is potentially going to be, he postulates. But then we would miss out on those early years, which, at least in my case, were extremely beneficial, I interject. Exactly, me too. I play with the cuff of his sleeve errantly, remembering those early days with Sherry. All of the questions, some of them embarrassing enough that I didn't feel comfortable asking my parents. She always answered me, making me feel like I was uniquely mature to be looking beyond my current life as a child. Do you think it's odd that neither of us entered the program to be mentors, I ask? After a few moments, Eric answers, No. Maybe the people who don't feel inclined to mentor are those who are more likely to pair and have children. I know that's why I didn't feel drawn to it. I knew I wanted kids and felt like there was a high probability that it would happen. You were that confident, hey? I tease. Eric grins, gripping my hand in his. I think we're doing all right, he says gently, and I squeeze his fingers. Are you saying I can keep Tal in my box? Maybe just a slightly expanded one. For now, Eric says, rubbing my shoulders as we stand and find the path that will take us home. Approaching our lane, I am taken off guard by the horde of people coming and going from our neighbor's house. Leaving Eric, I walk forward quickly, my eyes searching for Faye, but I don't find her familiar face. Come to think of it, I haven't seen her or Cameron at all lately. They have been our neighbors ever since we settled here. Their children are older, and we are on opposite schedules with our work assignments, so our paths don't often cross. Still, it's strange that I haven't seen anyone puttering around in the flower bed over the last few weeks. What kind of neighbor am I that I didn't even notice? I approach one of the strange men as he exits the house. 
He is dressed in a crisp blue collared shirt, navy blue tie, and khaki pants. Though he is engaged with something on his display and doesn't acknowledge me, I tap his shoulder. Excuse me, we live next door and I couldn't help but wonder what all the fuss is about. Is everything okay? I ask, smiling apologetically for the interruption. The couple here has been reassigned. That's all. He answers curtly. Reassigned? Yep. Can I ask what type of reassignment would require rehoming? I am met with a blank stare. I have never heard of anyone having to leave their home when changing service assignments. I try to clarify. Some changes require that. You could ask at your next training meeting and I'm sure they would give you better info. I'm not privy to the particulars of this situation. I thank him and retreat to our house. It seems odd that Faye wouldn't have said anything before leaving. She was such a support to me when the boys were born. Maybe the change just happened too quickly? They could have sent a message at the very least, though. The whole thing leaves me feeling strangely hollow and disappointed. That connection must have meant more to me than to her, I think. Upon entering the house, Eric motions excitedly for me to join him. The boys are already perched on stools next to his display. What's the rush? I ask, kicking off my shoes. Our scan results are in, Bentley shouts, and I run over to join them. The images are vibrant and beautiful. It's breathtaking to see the inner workings of the brain, and especially those of brains we have created. Why do Ben's and my scans always look different? Tal asks. You guys have slightly different genetics, and you are the oldest, Eric says absently, engrossed in the images. Bent is the youngest. That gives you divergent social experiences as well. I know that. I mean, why do you always spend more time looking at Bentley's scans over mine? Oh. I didn't realize he had noticed that. I look at Eric hoping he has a good explanation for this. His expression tells me he's not sure what to say either. Well, we spent more time on your scans when you were younger too, but you're right. We do have to spend a bit more time when it comes to Bentley, I admit. Is there something wrong with me? Bentley asks worriedly. No, bud, not at all, Eric assures him. It's actually a lot of good things that are responsible. Every scan from the time you were born has shown a really advanced genetic and social profile. Do you understand what that means? It means he's better than me, Tal mumbles, his body deflating. No way, that isn't true, Tal, I interject. It means that you have different needs. Do you think you are better than the kids whose brains haven't developed as quickly as yours? No, but it's the same thing. Mr. Dane is adjusting your conditioning based on your needs, not because you are better or worse. There is no judgment there. But why aren't Bentley and I the same? He asks earnestly. Dad and I were able to have kids because we both have viable profiles, so of course our children would enjoy those same benefits. You and Bentley are the same in so many ways, but unless we specifically farmed my eggs and Dad's sperm to get the exact progeny profile we wanted... There were going to be variations in what ended up matching naturally. Why don't they just do that for everyone? Then you'd get the right thing every time, Tal says. Bentley is wiggling and almost falls off his stool. Luckily, Eric grabs his arm and stabilizes him without losing his train of thought. People tried that before the crisis. It did give people exactly what they wanted. And made corporations a lot of money, I add. But there were plenty of unintended consequences, Eric finishes calmly, giving me a wink. What are unintended consequences? asks Bentley, putting his face closer to the shifting colors. Things people didn't know would happen? Usually bad, Tal answers. Right, Eric agrees. Parents would pay to create these perfect embryos, but the chances of them actually being viable inside of the mother and living until birth were small. They also didn't have the testing to be able to match up all of the needed markers to create a well-rounded, healthy child. Many of the variations they were looking for, like blue eyes, height, or gender, were actually also linked to disease and negative personality markers that they weren't aware of. And it was a huge waste of resources that really only favored the rich. The committee decided against it, I finish. But now you are left with one son who is not as viable as the other, he chides. Again, not true, Eric corrects. What do you think would happen if all of our gene variations were the same, or really similar? He turns and faces him. At this point, Bentley has proven completely incapable of successfully remaining upright on the stool. I lift him down, placating him by offering to read stories in the other room. Between lines in the book, I try to catch snippets of the conversation still taking place in the kitchen. In the meadow, a timid rabbit, I read softly, almost a whisper. 
Our world and our bodies are always adapting and changing. What if some new virus appeared tomorrow that targeted some system in our body that we've never paid attention to in the past? If all of our genes were too similar, the human race would be wiped out. We need that variation, Eric is explaining. He wondered how that could be, but sat scratching his ears instead of, So Bentley needs special stuff because of his genes and I'm here as a safety net? Tal asks, pretending to be offended. Hopping wildly, to and fro, imagining. Yep, that's why we had two kids. We got the safety net first and then decided to try for one that had a real chance of success. Eric says soberly. It's silent and I hold my breath. Of course not, Eric continues, his voice laden with affection. Mom, keep going, Bentley reminds me. Sorry, bud. He was still a rabbit, but there was always tomorrow. Both of you have incredible potential. Your path might be more traditional than Bentley's. I don't know. We have to kind of make things up as we go, using and learning from other people's experiences to create the opportunities he needs. Because that is really what he was after, after all. I finish. Bentley is still, and my guess is that he internalized more than just the book. I kiss him gently, tucking his miniature frame beneath the blankets. <laughs>